Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, you may have seen my message in the chat, but I just wanted to reiterate that my name is Catherine Gianni, and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Relations for BU Central PR Social Media Team. Um, today, we're going to be hearing from a member of the LinkedIn Client Solutions Team, Carly. Um, she's really excited to be here with everybody to talk a little bit more about LinkedIn um, when it comes to rocking your profile or optimizing your LinkedIn profile, both for um, a personal page or a page you might be running on behalf of a BU uh, group, lab, institute, center. So she's got a lot of really great information. Um, I included this in the Zoom chat, but I wanted to let everybody know that we will be sharing a full recording of this event early next week, um, as well as a full presentation slide deck for your review. There'll also be a post-event survey where you can leave feedback um, and any additional questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Carly to kick it off. There'll be a Q&A at the end as well, so please feel free to save your questions for the end, and we will get into it um, after the presentation. Thank you. Great. Right. Well, hi, everyone. It's nice to virtually meet you. Um, as Catherine mentioned, my name's Carly, and I'm Boston University's Client Solutions Manager here at LinkedIn. Um, I've been at LinkedIn for about two years now, and I'm based in the D.C. area, so not too far from Boston. Um, and I really support all marketing solutions within our higher education vertical. So we have a pretty packed agenda for today, um, but here's an overview of what we'll be covering. Um, as was mentioned, there will be time for Q&A at the end. Um, and while I can't see the chat right now, please feel free to drop in any questions you have there and we can go back and address those um, throughout. Again, this presentation will be shared, so don't feel like you need to jot everything down, um, but we'll definitely have time at the end for questions. So we're just going to start a little bit high level talking about the LinkedIn market, kind of where we are as a platform before diving a little bit deeper into some best practices. Um, so over the past 20 years, LinkedIn has really evolved in terms of how we're used as a platform. Uh, Pre-2017, we were really seen as a place to host your online resume and really as a tool to help bolster the job search. So really just a way to take that paper resume and put it online and share it out. But then in 2017, we really started to build out the feed and our member base. So you can see we increased from about 400 million members up to 800 million. Um, we enhanced our editorial team and really developed new ways to engage with members through articles, messaging, and news. But then in the past two years or so, we've really taken off when it comes to developing our ecosystem. So as many of you might have seen, if you are on LinkedIn, which I hope you all are, um, we hit a billion members, which was a really big milestone for us. Um, we've really enhanced the type of content and engagement we have when it comes to really being seen as that holistic publishing platform versus just that online resume as it used to be seen as. So building off the 1 billion members, um, I also just wanted to showcase a few stats to highlight really who is on LinkedIn and what information you're able uh, to gather across the platform. Um, I won't read these all off, um, but to name a few, we have over 135,000 schools on the platform, um, over 41,000 skills, and over 353 million monthly job applications. So there's a lot of different things you can do on the platform from job applications to newsletter subscriptions to uh, page interactions, um, and these stats are always continuing to grow. But when thinking about how our members engage with the platform, so not just kind of some of those stats that I shared, um, it's really shifted as you think about our evolution. Uh, so year over year, we've seen a 50% increase in feed engagement, which is huge. And again, continuing to grow. Um, content is posted 15 times more on platform than job posting. So that's really showing that shift from that pre-2017 job board view that we had. Um, and there are over 9 billion content impressions per week billion, not million. So it is a lot. There's a lot going on on LinkedIn every single week. So outside of where LinkedIn is today, I want to spend a majority of the time talking about how you all can bolster your own profiles. Um, we really see your LinkedIn profile as a digital portfolio that represents you and is a way for you to tell your professional story. So while we were seen as a resume in the past, think of it less as a resume and more as that digital profile that I mentioned that's engaging, it's visual, it highlights your experience and those skills to really build your presence. Um, so I'll kick off by giving some best practice recommendations recommendations. Um, and again, we'll be sharing this, um, but we'll leave some time for questions in terms of the profile tips at the end. 
So to start, this might seem like a no brainer, um, but make sure that you select a LinkedIn profile photo that truly represents you. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to tell your community who you are. And we've really seen a shift in that in recent years from really kind of being that buttoned up headshot to really just kind of showing more of someone's personality. Um, so it can take a lot of different forms. We really just recommend that it be high resolution, has good lighting, and really just features you. Um, and a fun fact that I actually just learned myself, um, but LinkedIn does now have photo filters that you can use to help polish your photo. Um, so there's no reason why you can't just take your own photo. It doesn't need to be a professional photo. Next is recording your name. Um, so this is an update that will have to be made on mobile. Um, but for best practices, we suggest limiting it to 10 seconds, limiting the background noise, and speaking slowly and clearly when recording so people can hear your name in full. Next, when it comes to pronouns, displaying your pronouns really helps you show up as your authentic self on LinkedIn. Our research shows that pronouns are core to your identity and how we wanna be seen and lets others know how to refer to you. Um, we found within that research that 70% 70 70 of job seekers believe it's important that recruiters and hiring managers know their gender pronouns. Um, so that's why that's one of the tips that we call out, but this is an optional field at the top of your profile. Um, next is adding your industry. So this is a really important step. Um, it's really, it's often how others will find you and add you to their own professional networks. Um, so through research too, we've seen that adding your industry will give you up to nine times more profile views and increases your discoverability with recruiter searches by 38x. So it really takes that step up when you're adding that industry. If you're looking for a new opportunity on LinkedIn, whether you're a student, a seasoned professional, regardless of where you are in your career, LinkedIn now allows you to set your job preferences. So you're, you'll have the ability to specify the job that you're searching for. You're able to now pinpoint the locations you're interested in and even select your job type. So especially since the pandemic, this has been a critical thing for people, but you're able to specify now if you want to be full-time, if you want to be remote, et cetera, you're able to call that out. Um, you can also specify your start date so your community knows how quickly you want to land your next opportunity. So if it's for the immediate future, Future. If you're looking six months out, you're able to specify that now. And then keep in mind too, there are two ways that you're able to share that you're open to work with your community. Um, so you can show it to all LinkedIn members. So that means it will automatically have that green open to work stripe um, on your profile photo. I'm sure many of you have seen that, um, but that's a way to show everyone that you're open to new opportunities. But we also have the opportunity to show that to recruiters only. So this will just privately share with them that you're open to work without displaying it on your profile if you want to keep it a little bit more under wraps. Next, we're going to look a little bit more about the details of your profile. So this is the about section, and this is where you will add your summary. So you can think of this as more or less your elevator pitch. Um, it should include an introduction to you and also highlight some of the accomplishments and aspirations that you have. We do recommend keeping it short and sweet, so no need to list all of your accomplishments. Um, that's what the experience section is for, which we'll go into in a minute. Um, so feel free to highlight any unique talents you have and really how you want to contribute and showcase yourself. Uh, typically, we recommend about 40 plus words here. So this is the experience section, um, and this is really the opportunity to tell your professional story and to talk about your accomplishments within each of the roles that you've had. Um, so you'll see a great way to show your showcase your experience is in short paragraphs um, rather than bullet points, which you often see on a resume. So you can use a couple of bullets here and there, um, but really we want the majority of it to read more or less like a story. So telling your professional story and the experience that you've had. Um, if you have worked at a startup or a smaller company, um, we think it's best practice to just include a little bit of an introduction of the company um, as well as a detail of your experience, just so you have that holistic information. Um, and lastly, it's great to talk about what you did in your role, but we've seen it has an even bigger impact if you're showcasing the results you delivered, the change you created. So really what you had an impact on within each of those positions. 
Next is looking at adding volunteer experience. So this is another great way to really round out your professional identity and uniquely tell your story. Um, make sure you add your volunteer experience if you're volunteering or if you volunteered in the past. Um, and with this, similar to um, the experience section, we do recommend you give a one to suit two to a one to two sentence description um, of what you do for that specific organization. So another great way to just provide that context to people looking at your profile. Next is looking at skills. So like I said earlier, I think we're at about 41,000 skills. Um, so this is a great way to showcase what you're great at. Um, adding at least five or more skills can get you up to 17 times more profile views. Um, so professionals are also able to search key skills across LinkedIn. So it's another great way to be found by your network. So not just your industry, not just the name, um, you're able to search by skills. And you are in full control of your skills. So you can choose what order they're displayed in, um, who endorses you for what skill. So you really have full control over what is listed on your profile and what skills you want to have showcased. Um, but another great way too, if you have skills outside of the experience that you have or outside of the volunteer experience you have, it's a great way to showcase this in a little bit of an easier kind of button click skill way. And finally, step 10, uh, recommendations are a great way for you to build your professional credibility. Um, if, you don't any, if you don't already have them, um, you can request these from a colleague, a manager, a partner, um, someone that you've worked closely with, whether in your day job or your volunteer experience. Um, there are a couple things to keep in mind when you are requesting a recommendation. Um, you are able to customize your request. So you can let the person know what you want to be recommended about specifically, whether that's a project you worked on, an initiative you led, you're really able Able to specify what you want the recommendation content to be. Um, similar, a lot of times when asking for a job recommendation, you can also make the request, especially if it's to kind of more senior leaders, executives, you can write them a first pass of what you want that recommendation to be. So that will save them a little bit of time, give them something to work with that they can edit and really make their own. Um, and you can even send them an outline to work with. So it's a great starting point. And one thing too, when it comes to these recommendations, um, make sure that you choose people who you've worked closely with and can provide those specific examples of your strengths, of your skills, of your experience. So that really shines through. So similar to the experience where you want to show your impact, you want that to relay through in these recommendations as well, because it really does bolster that credibility of your profile and is able to kind of show that within kind of that quick glance. Perfect. Um, so next, we're going to look at how you can build your voice on the platform. Um, as I mentioned, LinkedIn is a place where you can share your insights, your expertise, and your opinions um, with your professional community. So really starting with the bread and the butter of the feed, which I'm sure you are all familiar with, um, is a standard uh, standard post. So this is what goes live within the news feed. Um, so tips for this include keeping it really shorter. Um, the shorter, kind of keep it short and sweet, especially for mobile, um, knowing that it needs to be easily digestible. When it comes to hashtags, we find that three hashtags are a sweet spot with that. So I know I'm sure a lot of people have seen sometimes people will include 20 plus, ha 20 plus hashtags keep it to the shorter end if you can. Um, like I said, around three or so is really what's performed best. Um, and then when you're thinking about our algorithm and how that weighs content, how content is shown to members, comments are a really powerful tool here. So they weigh more than a like or a share and character count with these comments um, weighs the highest within how a post will perform. Um, so when it comes then to responding to comments, you can always respond. Um, one, because it helps with the algorithm, but also because it shows reciprocity and can really help uh, get that dialogue going. So a lot of times we'll kind of see comments be more or less those one-offs, but it's a great way to pose questions, engage with people who are following and viewing your content. Um, so something that we value heavily within the algorithm, but also a great way to connect with those who are in your network. So outside of the standard text post, we do have a few other formats that have worked really well. Polls are actually now available, which have been super engaging. You can now also upload documents. So that could be anything from a brochure to a slide deck, um, really any sort of PDF. And this gives you the opportunity to showcase that longer form content and looks deeper into your expertise. So while we say we want the text post to be a little bit smaller in terms of content, the document is really where you can have more of that information, especially if you're a student or you're putting out research. It's a great way to showcase some of that. 
Um, another thing that's been really powerful is testing video. Um, our COO, um, so the COO of LinkedIn, um, Dan Shapiro, likes doing walking and talking videos, um, and they've actually been really popular. We're going to go a little bit deeper into this example in a bit, um, but definitely something I recommend you all uh, check out. It's a really cool uh, new form of content. Um, so here we're going to talk a little bit about how you can build your own brand, um, but how that contributes to also building your organization or your school's brand as well. And there's a really easy and powerful way to accomplish this. Um, so one method of this is showcasing culture and storytelling on behalf of your organization or school. So photos of colleagues or fellow students works really well here. Um, and it really gives an inside view of your work or your school life, your organization or your school, and most importantly, the culture. So it provides that ba balance in terms of the type of content you're promoting. So it's not just kind of pushing things out, but it's showing kind of what the humanistic side of it is as well. And so we have seen that individuals oftentimes have between five to 10 times more connections than pages do followers. So thinking about that individual profile versus let's say the school page as an example. And those individual posts get on average two times the engagement. Um, so there's a really cool relationship between the two where by bolstering your organization, you're encouraging and capitalizing on a benefit to both. So by showcasing it on your personal profile, it's also benefiting the school or organization you work for or attend. Another tool we highly recommend um, is creator mode. Um, and this is something I'll be talking about in the q and I'm curious how many of you all do use creator mode, um, but this is something that you can activate on your LinkedIn profile in just a couple clicks. It's super easy. Um, and there are a number of reasons why we do recommend turning this on. Um, so mainly for executives or for people who are really present on the platform, it defaults your kind of connection request button to follow. So what that means is people will follow your content but you don't necessarily see theirs. So this works really well when you have um, a ton of connection requests and you're putting out a lot of content, a lot of people want to see it, they're able to follow you versus just connect. Um, it also makes your content more prevalent and visible on your profile. Um, so you can select up to five hashtags of what you write about. So it could say you talk about higher education, you talk about research, you talk about BU, things like that, that'll appear within your profile. Um, so this will help you be more discoverable and get more views and followers as you start sharing more and more posts. Um, LinkedIn will also highlight your original content on your profile. So it will move that up um, to your featured and activity section to be the first on your profile. So when someone's viewing you, they'll see the content you post before they go into your experience, your volunteer experience, your schools, et cetera. So you're able to see that um, right when you land on someone's profile. Um, so I mentioned featuring content as a part of creator mode. It's super easy to do and really beneficial. Um, so for any post that you create, there's three little buttons um, on the upper right. And so you can click this to feature your content and pin specific content to the top that you want to be visible on your page. So it isn't just the most recent content. It's what you want to be showcased. Um, so this is a way when people view your profile, they get right to the content you want them to see first. So even if you publish it six months ago, if it's still relevant and something you want to showcase, you're able to pin that. So similar to how some other social platforms work with pinning posts and things like that. Um, and then lastly, for those of you managing some of BU school pages, um, if you're really managing any company page across the platform, um, there are some common themes here when it comes to really bolstering these pages up. So first is to ensure your profile has complete information to help with increasing your weekly views. So very similar to your own personal profile, we recommend that for these school or company pages. So that includes your logo, an overview of the page, organizational information. If you have any job postings, it's great to include that on the platform as well. Um, and then when it comes to posting and engagement, we've seen that when companies post weekly, you'll see a two times lift in engagement with that content. So the more you post, the more likely people are then to engage with that. Um, so this is just an example here on screen um, with the BU Global Development Policy Center page. They're really doing a great job of consistently posting. You can see an example here. Um, there's already two posts within the last day or two. Um, so as long as the content is relevant and it's fresh and new, um, we recommend posting um, and sharing all of that great information. So we'll go into a little bit of best practices in terms of the type of content to post in a bit, um, but having that consistency helps with engagement and then will help with followers um, and things like that. 
Great. Um, so now we're going to dig a little bit deeper into how LinkedIn can help you then stay informed on other news and content. So not just what you're posting, but what other companies and professionals um, are posting based off of what matters most to you. Um, so kind of one of the bare minimum things you recommend is staying connected to the companies that matter most to you by following them. Um, so you're actually going to be automatically a follower of the companies that you work for that you have listed on your profile. Um, but this is a great way to do it for other companies that are of interest to you, even competitors. It's a great way to kind of keep them top of mind. Um, and you can do this by following the company's page by searching them um, right within the search bar at the top. And then you can filter by companies. Um, and then by following the company, you'll stay on top of any news they post, trends, new product launches, anything like that. Um, especially nowadays with how engagement has shifted so much on the platform, companies are posting consistently. So it's a really great way to stay on top of what's top of mind for them. You can also follow, follow industry influencers to stay on top of key trends, topics, and insights um, from those within various industries. Um, so you can follow them as an influencer and you can see their activity on the platform and within the feed. So this is similar to what I mentioned when you enable creator mode, um, you'll see the option to follow someone versus just connecting with them. So it's a really great way for you to see their content, even if you're not connected to them. LinkedIn also has advanced search filters. This is something that we're continuing to build up, um, but it's really a great way to help you find what matters most, most quickly. Um, so whether you're searching for a job, a company, a certain person, you can turn on your desired filter to get those most relevant search results. Um, so this is really great too, like I mentioned earlier, when it comes to including an industry on your profile, a lot of times recruiters or people are looking for people based off of the industry they work for, as you can see here, um, as one of the filter options. So it's a really great way to have that on your profile so you are um, more easily viewed. Um, and then lastly, as a member on LinkedIn, um, it's really important for us to give you full control over your LinkedIn feed. So we really want to empower you to consume the content that matters most. Um, so with that, you can manage your feed preferences by, again, clicking on the three buttons on the top right of any post and select improve your feed. Um, so you'll see here on the screen all of the examples of what you can do, um, but you can follow or unfollow people, companies, influencers. You can hide posts that aren't as relevant to you. Um, and you can also report any inappropriate content if you ever see it. That'll then trigger a flag with our team so we can pull it out of the feed. Um, one of the things um, that unique that LinkedIn has uniquely been focused on is really that safety and privacy. So while we're always going through and kind of monitoring feeds and making sure that any content um, is removed if it's inappropriate, um, we always appreciate people flagging that as well. And our team is pretty quick to respond. Um, so we've covered really the best tactics for how to optimize your profile and then the types of content you see. Um, but I want to move a little bit into the actual content that you're posting so you can really kind of maximize that impact. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit of a case study um, based off of one of the examples I shared a little bit earlier. Um, so like I said, I want to go deeper into this case study just because it's a really good example of that thought leadership as well as having an executive presence on the platform. Um, so hopefully this will give you just a few ideas in terms of building up the type of content you're posting, thinking about maybe what resonates most with people, especially if you're wanting to build up your connection and your follower base. Um, so I know I mentioned him a little bit earlier. Um, so this is Jan Dan Shapiro, our COO. Um, and so over the last couple of years, Dan has been incredibly active on LinkedIn. Um, and he's really been establishing himself as a thought leader through his Think About It blogs. Um, he actually came up with the name himself. So um, again, I mentioned, I recommend checking out some of these. Um, but this is really what I was talking about when I was showing how videos have been really valuable and engaging on the platform. Um, so really just want to take a deeper dive at this to hopefully give you all some ideas about what does work well, um, engaging audiences that might not already be connected or following with you right now. Um, so since Dan launched his Think About It videos, he launched them in 2021. Um, they've actually accounted for 64% 64 
of his reshares. So people are really loving this content and engaging with it far more than his other content. Um, these videos are, of course, part of a bit of a broader thought leadership strategy. Um, so you can see here, Dan has two articles and a video in his featured content section. So it's not just these videos that you post, um, but you can see up top here, it might be really small, but um, you can see too, he selected hashtags for what he talks about, which is highlighted at the top of his profile. So making his content more discoverable. So you can see some of the things that we've talked about, whether it's the hashtags or this pinned content here that you're able to showcase when you do have that creator mode enabled. Um, and so here are a few highlight examples of some of the top videos that have worked really well. Each have thousands of reactions. Um, so a type of content that has worked really well, and like I mentioned with the comments, is posing a question to followers. So it's a really great way to start that conversation because when you're posing a question, people are then more likely to respond in a comment. Um, and that'll then reach um, that conversational aspect of your content. Um, being authentic and informative, be your true self outside of just your profile with the content that you're sharing. Make sure it really reflects who you are as an individual as well as a professional. Um, and then showcasing what matters most. Of course, there's trending topics in various industries, but people are looking when they're following you, they wanna see what matters most to you. So also highlighting that. So um, representing anything that you've been working on, anything that's kind of piqued your interest, it doesn't necessarily need to always follow one certain topic. Um, so it can really run the gamut in terms of what matters most to you and is most relevant. Um, since the Think About It uh, vlogs launched, um, this data is from 2023, um, but those two, two years, as you can see here in the chart, in the chart, um, definitely show the impact that the release of this content has had. Um, he's seen more than 50% increase in his follower count and 2.7 thousand post reshares. Um, so again, that's not comments and likes, that's people resharing his content. So that's really resulted in ex an expansive reach on the platform. Um, he has over 140,000 followers to date, um, and this is really a growing follower base and has increased the likelihood of those content shares um, based off of his reach and resonance on LinkedIn. So you can really really see over time as you're consistently posting, consistently sharing new content um, that really impacts both those, both those engagement metrics as well as those follower metrics. Um, so taking a little bit of a deeper dive um, at that reach a little bit more. Um, so Dan's Think About It posts have reached a wide variety of members. Um, so as you can see here on the left side, um, many of those members do not work at LinkedIn. So I promise it's not just all of us following him and enjoying his content. We do take a little bit of that. But again, a lot of times when you're wanting to be a thought leader on the platform, you don't just want your closest friends and family and those you work with to follow you. You want those outside of that. You want to build your network a little bit more broadly. Um, so these are potential future decision makers, let's say, or when you think about this, if you're looking for jobs, potential employers. Um, so when you have that public profile, you're able to showcase this content to people who might not know you at this stage and puts your presence out there for them to then engage with you, whether you're looking for a job, whether you're wanting to build that thought leadership, there's a few different ways that you can go about it. Um, and definitely hitting a few different job functions as well. Um, so why does this content perform so well? I know I talked about the video piece of it being a big part of that, but outside of the video, what type of content is he sharing in those videos that has been performing so well? Um, so many of the things we've talked about, um, Dan has put into action. So he makes his videos authentic. Um, if you watch them, you'll see that he actually records them on his phone. So they're not overly formal and they really show his personality. So similar to that profile image, like I said, LinkedIn has really shifted in terms of how people are putting themselves out there. So you don't necessarily need to be in a suit and tie and be super buttoned up within your profile. People just want you to be authentic and showing your true self. Um, Dan, and also talks about topics that are timely to him, whether that's showcasing the gender parity that LinkedIn has reached or providing his input on AI or thoughts coming out of him attending event, um, an event. He's posting all the stuff in a timely way. So it's the right place at the right time. 
his also his content is also super engaging because it's unique. Um, so with almost 150 followers, he shows his audience who is because it's a big following of 150 K. Um, it is a diverse group of professionals. So he talks about a range of different topics, um, but wants to make sure that it's also appealing and insight insightful across his follower base. Um, so based off of that creator mode that you have enabled, you're able to dig a little bit deeper in terms of who's following you. So you can a tailor that content to them a little bit, but also also knowing you're likely wanting to build up your profile as well. It's a great way to engage new audiences. Um, and really to close things out, um, here's a cheat sheet for you. Um, again, we will be sharing all of this afterwards, um, but whether you're a student or a BU staff or faculty member, um, just a few key things I want to highlight. I promise I will not read everything on this slide since it will be a little bit of a repeat of what we covered. Um, but really the first most important thing is establishing a presence and a voice on the platform. So first and foremost, you need a complete profile. So I know I mentioned that for the school page, um, but again, for your own profile, this means a photo, a headline, showcasing your experience and having some context around that showcasing your skills. Um, so before you even start developing your voices, having that as a baseline will help build your credibility, but will also show people maybe what they can expect if they're going to follow or connect with you if they aren't as familiar with you as an individual. Um, we also do now have some AI tools that will help you with this. Um, so you don't necessarily need to develop all of it by scratch. We have a few tools that will help develop some of this content um, for you. And I mentioned again, with the profile image, we have some editing capabilities. So you're able to do that with a phone versus is a professional um, camera. And second, consistency and dialogue is key. So whatever it is you want to be posting and sharing about on LinkedIn, it'll be most effective if you do it with some level of consistency. So we do recommend sharing a piece of content at least monthly. So if you're just getting started with sharing content, wanting to feel a little bit more comfortable with it, Sharing something monthly is what we recommend, kind of getting your feet wet in the platform. Um, and then don't forget to engage and comment with others in the interim. So not only do you need to post your own content, it's really great to follow people, follow companies, comment, share, like those posts as well. Um, it's a great way to, again, start that dialogue, but also see, okay, what are others doing in the space that might be relevant to me? It might give you some ideas to think about when it comes to content to post. Um, so it's a really great way to not only follow those those who you're working directly with um, or companies that you're working for. But as I said before, those in the space. So you're really able to build that up by following and commenting on them. And then it helps too by bolstering some of that content within the feed. Great. So now we're at the Q&A section. I know I covered a lot of content here. Um, so I'll stop sharing momentarily if anyone is wanting to go back to any certain slide and ask any questions about it. We absolutely can do so, but wanted to make sure we had about 20 minutes or so um, for any questions that you all have. Thank you, Carly. Um, I can kind of help to moderate. I know we did receive a few questions in the Zoom chat throughout your presentation, and there were a few that were submitted beforehand that we can also dive into. Um, but one person did ask, just to clarify, is creator mode an option for business pages or is it just for personal profiles on LinkedIn? Yes. So that's an option for personal profiles. So that's something that you can en enable on your profile. Um, and then post content through that and be able to dig into analytics and things like that. So for anyone that has created or has access to a school or company page, the view is a little bit different, um, but you're able to do similar elements on the school or profile or company page, but creator mode is solely for profiles. Great. Uh, thank you. That's helpful. Um, another question that someone had asked, um, they were indicating that they had tried a few times to verify their profile using their BU email, but didn't receive a verification. Are there any restrictions with using like a school or education email? And just to add on to that as well, if folks are experiencing maybe some issues with logistics, are you a good contact to reach out to? Or are there other sources on your team that could be a resource? Yes. So for the first part of that, you're, you should be able to use a school or work email. Um, we honestly have recently implemented and recommend people leverage their work emails as a second form of verification. So there definitely shouldn't be an issue with that. So um, I can share my follow-up where you should be reaching out to if you do have any issues with setting up your profile. I know we recently launched to two-factor authentication. Um, so I'll share the correct route to go for that. But I know I didn't mention it at the beginning, but at the front of the deck, I did include 
my email. So if you do have any questions afterwards, or if you didn't get a chance to ask it today, you can always reach out to me and I will forward your email um, to the respective uh, LinkedIn team member. Great. Thank you. And just as a reminder, I'll be sending over early next week, the full deck. So that contact information will be there as well. Um, someone else just messaged me directly and said, how can I enable the visit my website link in my profile? Um, and I, I guess they are working with the premium membership. So is there a way to effectively do that? Sorry, could you just repeat the question? Um, a visit my website link. So I'm assuming this yeah. is a link um, to a personal website, um, including that or embedding that at the top of uh, their profile. And they have a pre they indicated they have a premium membership. Yes. And so that can go. So I know I mentioned there's kind of that about section at the top. So where you put more or less your kind of elevator pitch, that's a great place to showcase your website. So there's not going to be a separate field for you to be able to do that from an individual profile page. Um, but but that's a place to do it because it's about maybe a two or three sentence summary of your role. And if that website is kind of showcasing who you are, um, that's a great way to direct people directly there. Sure, absolutely. Um, and another question in the chat, and then I uh, see a hand raise as well. Um, somebody asked, which is better, post with emojis, tailored language, maybe with the help of AI, or posts written just as it was um, in words, simple language, no emojis. Uh, any thoughts on that? So there's been a lot of thoughts and questions recently about emojis. Um, so we really find that emojis are okay as long as you don't overdo it. So very similar to the hashtags, we recommend really a maximum of three um, versus kind of putting 12 plus emojis within a post because it really then muddles what the meat of the content is. So a lot of times when it comes to emojis, we've seen that work if you're kind of doing more or less a bulleted list. Um, but I say keep them to a minimum similar to hashtags, just have a few um, and really only where it's relevant and makes an impact versus having emojis just to have them. Great. Uh, that's helpful. Um, and we have someone who's raising their hand, um, ja Jasheen. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Hi, Carly. Thank you for this really informative uh, info session. I learned a lot. And I would say LinkedIn is like my favorite social media and I'm on it every day. I'm so um, glad to hear that. My question is regarding the top voice. So I see some of my uh, connections or people who I follow have a top voice badge on top of their profile. And uh, based on my, very, uh, my initial Google search, uh, I believe it's invite only. So I would love to learn a bit more in terms of how do we get into that invitation list? Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. So it's really, it's unfortunately not something that someone can apply for. It's more so internal members of LinkedIn are monitoring the feed, seeing what content is being posted, how people are interacting with an individual. And then that's where that invitation is extended. Um, so if that's something that someone or any of you are interested in being a part of, I'd say start off by really bolstering the type of content that you post on platform. So similar to Dan, um, find really what engages your, your followers and connections um, and really maximize on that. So by being consistently present on platform, having strong engagement, that's typically what will be that kind of next step to becoming a top voice. Um, and what we've seen works really well with those who are top voices right now. So they're posting consistently. So not really just that once a month posting cadence, um, but maybe every day, every other day um, at this stage. Thank you. Um, another question that came through on the chat, somebody asked, is creator mode available for the free version of LinkedIn? Of all the features presented, what is available for the free version versus requiring the premium version? Yes. So everything that I stated here is for the free version. So premium, more or less, there's a few different aspects of premium, um, but it really helps when it comes to um, that job search or if you're searching um, more so in a sales role, let's say. Um, so all the things that I talked about, you should be able to do with the free version of the profile, especially when it comes to building out that content on your own individual profile. Okay, great. That's great to know because I feel like sometimes there's um, questions or concerns, oh, maybe I won't be able to access as many features as I want if I'm not playing, paying for the platform, but it's nice to know that there's a whole host of different things that you can do even if you're not paying um, into the premium version. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really what with 
the, our emphasis on like privacy and all of that is we want to be fully transparent too in terms of the information you're able to get when you do have the free version. So we want you to be able to take advantage of the platform as much as possible. Um, so online, it will kind of list out what premium allows you to do. Um, but like I said, everything that you are, that I shared today, you're able to do um, without it. Great. Uh, um, somebody else wrote, I was exploring jobs um, in a recent company and a friend on LinkedIn said he saw my activity looking for a job in that particular company. Is there a way to disable that feature? So did this individual work at that company? It's a good I question. Know, I'm sorry. I know you didn't yeah. ask the question. No, no, it's okay. Um, either they no, can. Uh, I'll answer. Yeah. Uh, oh. No, he's not following that company. Okay. So there shouldn't be, I'm curious, and if you're able to share more information um, via email with me, because the only way, so someone should be able to see if you're open to kind of looking at different jobs with that open to work that I mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. You can see too, if people are kind of viewing different companies and profiles based off of your settings. Um, but I haven't heard of someone external from that company being able to see that you're looking for a job. Um, so if you want to send yep. me kind of an example of that, I can dig into what was going on there. Perfect. Because I got shocked when he said, oh, are you looking for a, a job in that company? I told him, no, I was just looking at the, the jobs. How did you know that? He said, right. I saw your activity saying that you are looking for a job. I'm not looking for a job. Just saying the, the looking yeah. at the, the jobs. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes so, uh, you can see if you're like engaging with the company. So if you're liking their content, if you're following them, things like that, people can see your comments. Um, but it shouldn't be if you're kind of applying or searching for a job unless they're a recruiter of that company. So yeah, feel free to send that to me and I can let you know what's going on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so sure. much. Thanks. Um, kind of turning to some questions that we had received prior to the event. Um, one person, and you touched on this briefly, but I would love if we could expand a little bit. One person did say, how can I use AI to my advantage within LinkedIn? And I was curious if you could talk about um, different integration that kind of exists in the platform. Is that being rolled out a little bit when it comes to updating job experience or maybe a personal statement at the top of your profile? in case folks aren't aware? Yeah, so AI, so we're rolling out AI in a few different ways. So on one hand, we're doing it more so from like an advertising standpoint when it comes to leveraging some ad copy and creative and things like that. But like I mentioned, we're also able to do that when it comes to bolstering your own profile and helping you develop some of the content. Um, so similarly to kind of chat GPT and how you're able to kind of put in an in put in kind of a cue of what you want someone to talk about. It can be very similar in that sense when building out that about section or that experience. So I'd say take the AI with a grain of salt because no one knows you and your experience better than yourself. Um, so I'd say use it more as a thought starter. So if you're not really sure as to where to start with developing kind of that experience story, um, AI is a great way to leverage kind of, okay, Here's a starting point in terms of how I can turn maybe a few bullets from my resume into more of a holistic three or four sentences. Um, but I'd say make sure it still sounds like your own voice. Again, you really want it to be um, a portrayal of who you are. And sometimes AI can sound kind of pretty in line with anyone's voice. So I'd say just make sure you're taking that with a grain of salt and kind of instilling your own personality within it. Absolutely. Um, another comment that we had in the chat, um, I guess somebody experienced their LinkedIn profile getting restricted for certain content mm -hmm. that they were sharing. Um, again, is that something that you might be able to help with if they connect with you or if you could offer support or other resources from maybe folks on your team? Yeah. So there's a contact uh, email that I can share with you in terms of kind of getting your profile set back up. Um, it shouldn't be unless it was fully removed. Um, you should be able to get that back, but I'll send you kind of where uh, to input that information. Great. That'd be helpful. Um, somebody else asked um, from kind of an organizational standpoint, just is LinkedIn currently working on anything um, just in terms of like kind of looking out for handling curbing AI generated content when it comes to posts people are sharing um, kind of while they're rolling out tools to help um, folks amplify or enhance their own profiles with AI? Yeah. So are you, and sorry, Thomas, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question on that. Um, are you more so thinking about like in terms of content that's being posted 
via AI versus like someone using that to then post directly. Yeah, I just think that it's, it's going to become a tool that everybody utilizes to maximize however the algorithm like transposes that information. It's like there's going to be a balanced approach where it, once you figure out how to game it, people are going to try and game it. So is, are, are people at LinkedIn already thinking about how do we curb that so that these feeds don't just get flooded with basically canned content? Yes. Yeah. And that's kind of where our algorithm comes into play. So just because content's being pushed out there, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be like what's always at the top of the feed. We're looking for where like that engagement as an example is really prevalent. And that's something that will weigh more than in other or kind of looking at the content outside of just things that are being posted. There's various things that we weigh um, so that it's not just, I don't know, AI more or less content being posted. Um, when it comes to like any bot or spam profiles as well, that's something our team is also constantly um, keeping an eye on. So typically if we see any kind of bot or spammy content being posted, or if someone's attending a LinkedIn Live and posting kind of spam content, we're automatically deactivating those profiles. So that's another way we're kind of going. It's a little bit outside of that, but that's also something that we're doing in the background. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else, I know you touched upon kind of content generation for individual profiles versus um, a page for a specific unit at the university, but someone was asking if there are any best practices for creating a specific page for a research center or a lab, um, as an example here at BU. Like, what does the process look like for actually setting up that page? Yeah. Absolutely. So this, it in part depends on what your school or organization's strategy is, but typically what we recommend is having a primary school page for Boston University as an example. And then what you can do from there is set up showcase pages. So BU would be the umbrella, and then you can have as many showcase pages as you want beneath that. So that's a really great way if you have various schools and programs, if you have a research center as an example, it'll be its own page, but it will live within the BU umbrella. So again, it kind of depends what your team internally manages and if you want it to all fall under that, um, but that's typically what we've seen works best. Sure. And I will just from the, the BU perspective, I will also say, you know, if there are folks that are interested in kind of thinking of best practices in terms of branding or um, more specific questions about the BU side of setting up a LinkedIn page, I'll include this is our office's email alias. So, so my team would be happy to connect um, if there are further questions about that, especially from some of those initial stages of setting up a page. So we can certainly chat more um, if any other questions questions arise. So just wanted to, to put that out there. Um, kind of turning back again to just a few more questions that we received before the presentation. Um, a researcher had written in and they said, what type of post is better to publish on LinkedIn? Just personal stories or formal links focusing on research results, awards, et cetera, or potentially a mix of both? So I would say the latter, a mix of both. Um, so again, when it comes to the content that you're posting, I'd say make sure that it's authentic and it's timely. But I say by hitting on various topics, it both shows a little bit more about who you are and what you care about. Um, so I'd say when it comes to the personal side of it, of course, we're a little bit different than Meta and Instagram. Um, but as you've probably seen more recently, people are posting more personal content, especially in the job market, kind of where they are in their journey. Um, so it's a really great way to do both, to show kind of where you, what you're doing individually, but also some of the research that you're doing, because yes, we are a professional platform, but also every professional has a personal life as well. So it's really good to kind of mix those two together and show your full self. Definitely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Thomas also asked, could you dive more into niche rules for content posting? For example, you see influencers on YouTube sharing tips like don't edit a grammatical error on a post for hours because it'll impact the algorithm performance. Is that even true or maybe a similar vein of thought? Is there truth behind that? Yeah, so you can edit. We haven't seen any impacts with performance if you are editing the content. Um, so you're able to edit any of the copy. You're If you shared a video or a photo, you're not able to edit that. Um, so you would have to delete and reshare. So typically what we say is changing any of the content is a-okay, but if it's a photo or a video that you're wanting to adjust, I'd say look at how long your post has been up and what engagement is looking like thus far. So 
if you don't have a ton of engagement or it's something you just posted, it's okay to delete and reshare. Um, but if it's something that has been live for a while and it's not a huge edit, I would say typically keep it to avoid losing any of that engagement that you had on the initial post. Um, if you need to edit, delete it just because you did something totally off base, um, I say just keep your fingers crossed that the same people will engage with it one more time. Yes. Uh, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, um, and then I'm just looking through our list here. Um, there was a few questions again, when it comes to responding to LinkedIn invitations, uh, to reply to questions based on one's professional expertise or research areas, any thoughts on that versus just staying connected to folks who maybe are just interested in connecting on a more personal level, like kind of do's and don'ts or, um, any tips there? Yeah. So I'd say it kind of depends in terms of, how many connection requests you're getting. Um, if you're getting a ton of requests, that's where I recommend enabling that creator mode. So no, the default is to follow you versus connect with you. Um, I'd say one of the big things about connections is, I guess the big difference between connections and followers is if someone's connected with you, not only can they see your content, but you can see theirs. So if they're not someone that you want to have that relationship with on the platform, then it's okay to not accept that. They can still follow you. Um, and then if you are just, if they're just a follower of you, you won't be able to see their content. Um, it's great to build up your profile and have a lot of connections, but I'd say there's kind of that sweet spot in terms of if you're not wanting to see their content or you don't feel like you know them and you don't want to connect with them, that is okay. They're still able to follow you. Um, but if you do want to connect with them and not see their content, that's where you can kind of tailor that in feed and say, I just don't want to see any of of their content, but we'll still be connected. So there's a few different levers that you can pull based off of kind of who the individual is, why they're wanting to connect with you and things like that based off of the relationship you have. Sure. And um, just pulling one final question as we approach four o'clock, but um, one person had asked previously um, kind of the ins and outs around LinkedIn articles, um, sort of the differences between that and a traditional post on your feed, how you would go about posting a LinkedIn article and kind of what content could potentially perform well there. Yeah. So a LinkedIn article is more so that long form content. So We've seen it work really well, kind of both from an individual, but also from an organization standpoint. So if you have kind of paragraphs and paragraphs of copy, it's a really great way to showcase that in a way that isn't overwhelming. Um, I know I mentioned we kind of recommend posts in feed being kind of short and sweet. So if you do have that longer form content, that's where those articles can really work well. Um, we do have newsletters now as well, which can come from a school or a company page or an individual. And so that's a great way if you feel like you're going to be posting consistent article content to set up a newsletter. So you can have people subscribe to it and consistently send out um, content to them that way. It's a nice way too, a lot of times, especially more so from like the organizational standpoint to get in front of people outside of just their inbox. So I know many people have like thousands of unread Gmail um, emails. So it's a nice way to kind of get that content in front of them in a different forum. So it would be within LinkedIn. Definitely. Great. Uh, well, unless anyone has any additional questions, they want to use the raise hand function or put any final thoughts in the chat. Um, Carly, I really want to thank you for taking the time to join us for this session today. Um, I feel like it was hugely informative. I know myself, I even learned a lot and different tips that I want to be putting on my personal LinkedIn. Um, so this has been great. As one last reminder, I want to let everyone know early next week, we will be sharing a post-event survey, um, a full recording of this session, as well as the full slide deck for folks to review. Um, if there's any questions, Carly's uh, contact information will also be listed on there. And I've included um, our team's PR alias email as well. So um, from the BU side, we're also happy to chat a little bit more about LinkedIn presence or any other um, comms or social media needs. So thank you again, Carly. This has been wonderful. Thank you all. And like I said, um, you'll have my email or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn.